On December 6, 1492, Christopher Columbus planted the Spanish flag on an island in the Caribbean inhabited by the Tejano people. They called their island Haiti, or the land of mountains. Columbus renamed the island Hispaniola, or Little Spain. The Spanish cruelly enslaved the Tejano people to perform the backbreaking labor necessary for the establishment of their colony. As a result, the Tejano population was decimated within a few short years. Saint-Domingue had been the most brutal of Europe's colonies in the New World and the most successful until a violent slave revolt in 1791 had changed all that, releasing hundreds of thousands from their bondage and overturning the plantation economy. Haiti is always described as the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. But during its height at Saint-Domingue, it was the richest place in the Americas. The thing about it, though, is that its richness was all rooted in slaves. Its wealth was based on human capital, on owning that human capital. In what respects was the Haitian Revolution of the late 1790s and early 1800s a critical global event? Well, today we see the Haitian Revolution, uh, which destroyed slavery in that island, which was a very powerful institution, and which established the second independent nation in the New World after the United States. We see it as part of the age of revolution, the age of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Haitian Revolution. And uh, it was uh, as important as the others in some respects. Certainly it struck fear throughout the Western Hemisphere among slave owners and their supporters, the idea of the slaves rising up en masse and actually overthrowing the system of slavery was the great nightmare of slave owners everywhere, including in the southern United States. Um, on the other hand, it was a source of inspiration to black people all around the world. Uh, in Africa, in Latin America, in the rest of the Caribbean, in the United States. Here was a group of black people, slaves, who asserted their own freedom, who claimed their own freedom. So, uh, in other words, the, the, the impact of the Haitian Revolution rippled out from Haiti, a small uh, island, to influence the whole Atlantic world uh, really well into the 19th century because of what it symbolized both for the vulnerability of slavery and for the aspirations for freedom of the millions of uh, African-American slaves. So the first two declarations of independence in the world are the American and the Haitian, right? And these are the first two texts of that type, and yet they couldn't be more different in a sense. They're very different in tone. Um, one crucial difference is that one of those, you know, one of them, the American, is written at the beginning of a war in a sense, and the other is written at the end of a war. I think in the broader sense, though, what's interesting is how fundamental Haiti was towards the kind of progress of, of anti-slavery um, in, the, in, the, in the long term. Now, there's debates about immediately what, what effect it had um, on British abolition and French abolition and so forth. But there's a way in which the Haitian Revolution had kind of fundamentally changed the conversation in, in, in a way that was kind of irreversible. Um, I mean, after the Haitian Revolution, you have kind of established as a very strong argument um, that there's simply no way to claim universal rights while continuing to main slaver, maintain slavery. The, the Haitian revolutionaries had kind of, I think, pushed forward the kind of idea of universalism in a, in a fundamental way. Um, and afterwards, everybody has to kind of reconfigure their arguments in, in, in some ways in relationship to that. Um, and they're going to often represent Haiti in either positive or negative ways as part of their own arguments about how slavery uh, should be dealt with. In the United States, that's very much the case. Um, and in fact, Haiti is referred to constantly in the debates about slavery in the United States in the 19th century. In the summer of 1789, when Haiti was still the dormant colony of Saint-Domingue, it was France that grabbed the world's attention. Parisian mobs rioted against the French king and against their own desperate poverty. Chanting slogans for liberty, equality, and brotherhood, they sparked a revolution that would fill history books for centuries to come. Liberty, equality, fraternity, that was new for the world. Toussaint Louverture is the epitome of humanity. He realized early on that the condition he was in was totally insufferable. Toussaint Louverture recruited 
about three to 4,000 people, trained them, and they fought the French, the British, and the Spanish army for 12 years. They burned the mechanisms of their production. They're burning the plantation fields, burning down the houses. It was a wholesale massacre on a really, really enormous scale. It was a big, big, major payback time. The Haitian Revolution is probably the most profound revolution ever realized by human beings. The only place where slaves created a nation. We're all very familiar with the popular images of Haiti that we see on television. Poverty, food riots, military coups, tremendous instability, and of course, the devastating impact of the earthquake. But how many of us know anything at all about Haiti's noble heritage? The fact that it was a center for the fighting of freedom in the 18th century and the fact that Haiti possesses one of the greatest cultures in the entire New World. That's what I'm here to find out about. To begin to understand the history of Haiti, I'm leaving the devastation of Port-au-Prince and traveling to the northern side of the island. To Cap Haitien, Haiti's historic second city. Cap Francais, as it was then known, was the first permanent French settlement on Hispaniola. The French took advantage of the weakness of the Spanish in Santo Domingo to found their own colony in the West. When the island was formally divided in 1697, Cap Haitien became the commercial hub for the French side. it became the main port of entry for the growing trade in African slaves. The number of Africans shipped to Haiti during the slave trade is staggering. 774,000, 300,000 more than came to the entire United States during the slave trade. If you look at the Atlantic during this period, North America is actually kind of on the edge of the, of the system, right? It's actually not creating the same density of profits, and it's not, it's not, it's not receiving the same number of slaves either. Um, because of crop difference, because of uh, the different forms of settlement, there's all, all kinds of reasons. But the fact is that within both the British and the French Empire, the Caribbean colonies um, are kind of the economic powerhouses, right? And the result of that is that the slave importation is hugely focused on, on the Caribbean, um, m many more numbers going there. Um, it's also true that the death rates are much higher in the Caribbean. Um, so you have a massive importation of slaves into Saint-Domingue, but very, very high death rates, right? So that um, over the course, say, over the course of the 18th century, um, we're talking about 800,000 800, perhaps more brought in. Um, and at the end of that time, you have 500,000 uh, slave population or less, actually. Um, so, so the number of deaths are, are extremely high. Um, and, and basically, that, that also creates a demographic reality that's really important during the Haitian Revolution, which is that the majority of people in Haiti um, in 1804 and in, in Saint-Domingue in 1791 are African-born, right? These are people who grew up within Africa, um, who have direct kind of links, personal links, individual links back to the continent. Um, so this is Africa. There's a line John Thornton at one point says, you know, in the 18th century, Africa was not surviving, it was arriving. Um, and in a place like Haiti, that's very, very clear that this is a population in which, you know, you would have heard all kinds of different African languages. There were different religious practices. There was music, culture, uh, political ideologies, um, religious and so forth, all of that is being um, kind of present, uh, reformulated. There's, there's arrivals kind of each year. Um, by the time right before the Haitian Revolution, you're getting about 40,000 uh, you know, arrivals a year. So you're talking about massive numbers, and that all shapes the context uh, very much of the revolution. Haiti was the richest colony in the entire New World. It was the jewel in France's crown. The reason for this fabulous wealth? Sugar. Walking around Cap Haitien's historic market, it's difficult to imagine just how important Haiti was to France. Haiti was known as the Pearl of the Antilles. By the mid-1700s, this colony, 
little bigger than Maryland, produced nearly half the world's sugar and generated two-fifths of France's overseas trade. It was easy, even for France's political radicals, to ignore the agony that made it all possible. The whole concept of slavery itself is, is a totally savage one. The French, they brought it down to science. A slave coming from Africa would not last three years the way the system it was organized. The accounts about the tortures inflicted on slaves are, are often horrifying. Legs cut off or arms cut off, amputations for runaways, rubbing hot powder or, or pepper and so forth into the wounds. Slaves actually hung and left to die. You can kind of imagine that this kind of world in which essentially human life was given so little value that these tortures were kind of refined to this incredible, cruel effect. On August 14, 1791, the Haitian Revolution began with the voodoo ceremony held by Duty Brooklyn, a voodoo priest from Jamaica. The result was the slave uprising on August 21st, 1791. Bukmandati was a slave and a voodoo priest. In August 1791, as Saint Domingue's white and mixed race population squared off for a showdown, Bukman called together slaves from neighboring plantations. Bookman had called them to an area called Wakaima. First on the agenda was strategy. That ceremony of Wakaima is the first Haitian Congress, the beginning of the revolution. C'est dans cette réunion où l'Africain décide de n'être plus esclave, d'être libre, déjà là dans la tête, de casser cette chaîne dans la, dans la tête, de dire voilà à partir de cette cérémonie, on prend l'Africain après son destin en main. Haitian tradition says the slaves of Saint-Domingue planned that night to revolt. They timed their uprising to start on multiple plantations in two weeks' time. On the night of August 22, 1791, a thousand enslaved Africans attacked their masters. Les esclaves empoisonnaient. Les esclaves piquaient, les esclaves tuaient. Les esclaves voulaient leur indépendance. For them to be free, they have to have the same amount of violence that you exerted on them. That's why the revolution was very brutal. This is that hatred in the first day that came out. Some blacks managed to escape slavery. Many had been born free, fathered by white planters. Others had gained freedom through their own wits or talents. One such man was Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint is, I think, uh, one of the most incredible figures that I know about in, in, in many ways. He's born on a plantation in Saint-Domingue. He grows up on that plantation. That plantation was owned by a man who was tolerant for the times. Toussaint was taught to read and write as a child. He eventually occupies a, a somewhat 
privileged role, if you can say that on a plantation, as, as a coachman and, and has a kind of relationship with the managers and masters in some ways. He becomes free in the 1770s, so he's somebody who kind of occupied different roles in society. And I think that's the key for understanding Toussaint, is that he saw possibilities where other people didn't. He had businesses, had contacts in the U.S. and elsewhere, bank accounts, managed his affairs pretty well. The man was endless in organizational capacity. I mean, he would have been a fantastic CEO today. Toussaint had certainly read a text by L'Abbé Reynal, which predicted that out of the colonial slave system with its you know, frightening imbalance of numbers and horrible suffering and all of that, there would emerge a leader, revolutionary leader. I believe Reynal referred to him as a black Spartacus. I am Toussaint Louverture. My name is perhaps known to you. In 1793, he wrote an open letter to the islands disenfranchised. I have undertaken vengeance. I want liberty and equality to reign in Saint-Domingue. I work to bring them into existence. Unite yourselves to us, brothers, and fight with us for the same cause with his letter, he announces two things. He announces, first of all, his commitment to the process, to the project of emancipation, and he announces his presence as a leader, maybe even the leader. He has gained great respect from his followers. And with this proclamation, he's essentially saying, you want freedom, and I'm the one who's gonna bring you that freedom. So I'm the person to follow in this regard. But to say at this time was addressing the wider world too. He was particularly focused on Spain. The Spanish wanted to wrestle the colony away from France for two reasons. First, the colony was very, very prosperous in spite of the war. And second, that prosperity was used by the French Revolution to combat them in Europe. Spain controlled Saint-Domingue's neighboring colony. So in June of 1793, Toussaint struck a deal. Spanish garrisons, just over the border, provided guns and ammunition to the slave army and tipped the balance their way. Toussaint's forces captured three cities within eight months. Toussaint Louverture was a talented general for the Spanish and a Saint-Domingan free black man that betrayed France after they executed Louis XVI. He returned to the French side, however, when he realized that Saltonax's general emancipation was permanent. Louverture's profound military and leadership skills immediately became a turning point in the war. Toussaint realized that Spain had a king, England had a king, and France was talking about liberty, equality, fraternity. All men equal. So he realized that although the revolt started by fighting the French, the French right now could be the best help they could receive. So he rejoined the French. After three years in opposition, Toussaint Louverture was once again a loyal French citizen. So were his followers. It tipped the balance. Before long, Toussaint de Salines and the army of ex-slaves pushed the Spanish out of Saint-Domingue. The British soon followed. Word of Toussaint's astonishing string of victories against white armies was spreading across the European world. In 1798, as Toussaint Louverture was evicting the last of the British from his island, another French general battled British interest halfway around the world in Egypt. His name was Napoleon Bonaparte. Well, Toussaint and Napoleon in many ways are, are similar. Both were a little bit from the margins of French society. They succeeded through military brilliance, and they're both incredible military leaders, and they became political leaders as a result of their military experience. Just months after conquering Egypt, 
Napoleon marched into Paris, a coup d'état toppled the revolutionary government, and Napoleon took the reins of power. The revolution is over, he declared. I am the revolution. As Napoleon is rising to power in France, Toussaint is watching closely about what's going on. He knows several things. He knows, first of all, that there are very powerful pro-slavery voices in France who are, adv who are agitating against him, attacking him, and proposing that slavery actually be recreated in some form in Saint-Domingue. Napoleon Bonaparte had had enough of revolution, and according to Napoleon, the U.S. president, Thomas Jefferson, shared his view. The prospect of a black republic is equally disturbing to the Spanish, the English, and the Americans. Jefferson has promised that at the instant the French army has arrived, all measures will be taken to starve Toussaint. Rid us of these gilded Negroes, and we will have nothing more to wish for. Toussaint tried urgently to show Napoleon that military logic, if nothing else, proved the merit of black ambitions. Toussaint was writing Napoleon. He wanted so much to be recognized as saving this land for France. His efforts failed. In 1802, Toussaint was stunned to see the largest French expeditionary force ever assembled entering Saint-Domingue's harbor. Its mission was simple. Napoleon wanted to turn back the clock. My decision to destroy the authority of the blacks in Saint-Domingue is not so much based on consideration of commerce and money as on the need to block forever the march of the blacks in the world. Toussaint Louverture fought the invading French army for three grueling months, but the island's black population, now disenchanted with his leadership, offered lackluster support. On May 6, 1802, Toussaint Louverture surrendered. At first, he was allowed to retire from the army with full honors. But a month later, he was called to a meeting with the French commander. If I wanted to count all the services that I have rendered to the French government, I will need several volumes, and still, I wouldn't finish it all. Toussaint was arrested on charges of conspiracy. In 1802, the French, under Napoleon Bonaparte, reversed the emancipation of the slaves. Toussaint was tricked and arrested, and then sent to a French prison where he died in exile. The Haitians rose up against the French once again to stop the reimposition of slavery. Saint-Domingue remained mostly calm in Toussaint's wake. Jean-Jacques Dessalines and the other black officers continued cooperating with French general Victor Leclerc. But then, news arrived from the nearby colony of Guadeloupe. Napoleon had reinstated slavery. Leclerc reported that he had Dessalines in his pocket and controlled him and had mastered his spirit. Well, ha ha, he was extremely wrong about that. Saint-Domingue erupted in anger and fear. Dessalines quickly broke from France. One more time, the former slaves of Saint-Domingue took to the field against European armies. Dessalines is a no holds bar, no compromising leader and figure who is going to eradicate anything that stands in the way of what the people have been mobilizing towards. That's generally reported that Dessalines killed all the white people, a massacre of all white people, a race war. No, not really. There's one report by a survivor who managed to get out to escape by masquerading as an American, because Dessalines was not killing Americans or English, just French. The war becomes this extreme scorched earth kind of campaign in which Dessalines and others burn the towns in order to basically leave the French with little, with no choice but to depart. 
Desalines' scorched earth tactics worked. In 1803, the French army was finally driven out. 50,000 French soldiers had died. And Saint-Domingue, Haiti, became the world's first black republic. The slaves outnumbered the colonists 10 to 1. Their rebellion would lead to independence for Haiti. It would also alter the course of a young country called the United States. At the time, the U.S. was looking to buy the French-controlled port of New Orleans. But Napoleon surprised the Americans by offering a much bigger land deal. Land the French emperor no longer wanted after losing his more profitable colony in Haiti. Once that's lost, France says, well, you can have the whole of the Louisiana Territory, not just New Orleans. The Louisiana Purchase would double the size of the United States. So the American Midwest as we know it would not really exist without the Haitian Revolution. Pushing France to give up on its designs for empire in the Western Hemisphere. At Berthier, just outside Cap Haitien, the Haitian forces under Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Toussaint's successor, routed the French army for the last time. This brilliant general, a former slave himself, was determined that slavery would never return to Haiti. When he declared independence on January 1st, 1804, his stirring words left nothing to chance. Let them tremble when they approach our coast. If not from the memory of those cruelties they perpetrated here, then from the terrible resolution that we will have made to put to death anyone born French whose profane foot soils the land of liberty. Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Declaration of Independence of Haiti, 1804. Dessalines felt that the French, given any opportunity, would reimpose slavery on this island. And you know what? Dessalines was absolutely right. And he thought, perhaps mistakenly, that unless he wiped them out, slavery would return. So shortly after reading this statement, Dessalines ordered the massacre of the French people on this island, um, an act that shocked not only the nations of Europe and the United States, of course, but even many of his peers. Two years later, Dessalines himself would be assassinated by the very generals with whom he defeated the French. Sans Souci, a remarkable fairy tale palace in the countryside just outside Cap Haitien, was built by Dessalines' successor, King Henri Christophe. A brilliant soldier, Christophe had fought in the American Revolution and had been Dessalines' right hand man in the war against the French. Haiti's continued survival now rested squarely on his shoulders. France, Britain, and America all refused to recognize Haiti. They could never allow it to become an example to other enslaved people in the rest of the Americas. Fearful of invasion, Christophe constructed a great fortress known as the Citadel. Built atop a 3,000-foot peak, it took 20,000 men to construct. It's still the largest fortress in the entire Western Hemisphere. Take a look. On top of the mountain right there, mm -hmm. there's another fort. Uh -huh. Next to it, there's another fort. Yeah, I see. Yes. So that one could sustain a guerrilla war against any invading force. It's taking my breath away. Yes. I had no idea that it would be this awe-inspiring. No foreign troops would ever test the strength of the walls of the Citadel, but they didn't need to. Haiti's enemies used other means to cripple the world's first black republic. Actually, the invasion did come, but not in the form that Christophe thought. It came in the form of trade embargoes, of blockades, and the systematic denigration of the Haitian people, the denial of the right of black people to govern themselves, 
and no one pursued that policy with more vigor and passion than our own President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson called Toussaint and the Haitian freedom fighters cannibals of the terrible republic. The French, too, did everything they could to cripple Haiti. No countries acknowledge Haiti's independence in 1804. Um, they're kind of looking to the French to, to await the French acknowledgement. That many countries trade with Haiti and they have economic relations with it anyway, but there's not a political recognition um, until 1825 when the French um, essentially kind of force Haiti to pay, uh, to pay reparations, of a kind of reparations or an indemnity is what, what it is, um, money that is to go to the French plantation owners who had lost uh, property during the revolution. A very very large sum that's kind of levied. Uh, the Haitian state can't pay it, and so the French French banks actually give them loans to start paying this indemnity. Um, and this indemnity is going to kind of weigh on the Haitian treasury basically all the way through the 19th century. Um, Haiti has this kind of enters into this cycle of debt that we're familiar with today, um, but extremely early, right? We're talking about about 200 years of, of this kind of cycle of debt that, that Haiti has gone through, which of course has devastating consequences on the, uh, the capacity of the state um, within the country. Under embargo and the threat of invasion from France, Haiti was forced to pay 150 million gold francs to France for the loss of property, namely slaves. This was eventually reduced to 90 million, the equivalent of more than 21 billion dollars today. And they were paying that debt off, you know, right through to 1947. Nineteen of those years were passed under a brutal U.S. military occupation. Fifteen United States Marines land in Haiti to battle Haitian bandits, threatening destruction of American property. Foreign intervention in Haiti's affairs would become even more blatant. On July 28, 1915, the United States Marines landed in Port-au-Prince, just as they would do in the Dominican Republic a year later. Their declared aim was to protect American and foreign interests. In other words, to ensure that Haiti paid its debt to America and France. For 19 years, the United States wielded an absolute veto over all government decisions, while the provinces came under the rule of Marine commanders. The role that, that, that journalists tend to be comfortable when they come to talk about Haiti is in the role of the victim. If you ask why are the Haitians so poor and why are they presented then constantly as the poorest nation in the hemisphere and so on, which is true, it is the poorest nation in the hemisphere. It has to do with three factors, all of which are a function really of Haiti's independence and the strength of its people. The first is the fact that they became independent by overcoming slavery themselves and the consequence of that was a war that killed a third of the population that left the country in ruins and then left it isolated by an international embargo that was designed to quarantine the country. So a big reason why Haiti's poor has to do with the fact that they fought for their freedom and won it rather than receive it, you know. Second reason is the price they were, the, the Haitian small farmers in particular, the majority of the population, were forced to pay for refusing to follow a dominant trend in world history, which was the one that saw small farmers pushed off their land in all parts of the world, starting in Europe and later in Europe's colonies, into uh, slums where they could be exploited by, by, by industry. And that didn't happen in Haiti until much later than other places because Haitian farmers were determined to resist it. And so that provoked uh, a reaction in the form of a very severe neoliberal plan backed up by, by, by extremely violent forms of paramilitary coercion. The, the army and the Tonton Macoutes that uh, the Duvalier dictators uh, developed to push this process through. And uh, the result then was a um, you know, very severe level of um, of exploitation and impoverishment, particularly in the countryside. And essentially, what he did was orchestrated or oversaw a policy of, of, of creating jobs, low-paying jobs, you know, sweatshop jobs, which then sort of facilitate simply the export, uh, export component of, of the Haitian economy at the expense of developing the, uh, the agricultural part of the economy. Now, Haiti had been self-sufficient in rice up until the 1970s, forcing them into these urban areas and trying to find some place to live, building facilities, building homes, living in spaces that are, 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 shouldn't be inhabited, 
They don't have any, they have a very weak in structure. And so this in exasperates the situation where you have either a, a, a hurricane or you have, in this situation, a, uh, a, a, an earthquake of seven, over seven points. When Papa Doc died, his 19-year-old son, known as Baby Doc, replaced him. Baby Doc followed the same principles as his father, as laid out in this 1972 interview with 60 Minutes. The aim of my government is to increase the volume of foreign investment and at the same time to promote the development of tourism. He ruled with an iron fist for 15 years before a popular uprising forced him out of office. When the Duvalier dictatorship is mentioned in earthquake coverage, the support they receive from Western powers is habitually left out. So that was the second reason why Haiti's poor, and a third is has to do with the political steps that they took to try and fight this neoliberalism by precisely by, you know, uh, by electing a government that could represent um, a political alternative to neoliberalism. So a movement, a popular movement, develops in the, in the 1980s to fight this tendency, and it elects a government on an anti-neoliberal agenda in 1990. And the story of Haiti ever since has been. Uh, really, I think, driven by the measures uh, taken by the international community and by the small Haitian elite to force that government and to force this popular movement to, into accepting this neoliberal plan that has directly resulted in the impoverishment of the great majority of its people. This has included U.S.-backed coups against the Aristide government in both 1991 and 2004. In recent years, however, Canada has largely taken over the role of undermining Haitian democracy. This according to Canadian independent journalist and author of Canada in Haiti, Anthony Fenton. From the moment Aristide was re-elected in 2000 until he left, fled, was kidnapped from Haiti in 2004, Canada played a deliberate role undermining, you know, following in lockstep with U.S. policy, starved it of loans, they starved it of being able to fulfill their democratic mandate. They uh, empowered Haiti's elite, fueled a disinformation campaign. And then, uh, in an unprecedented way, Canada played a leadership role as a, as a regional uh, imperial power, propping up an illegitimate regime from 2004 to 2006, imposing the neoliberal agenda that uh, they tried for so long to impose on Haiti. And uh, this, is, this is the new face of Canada. This is Canada for the 21st century. Canada has also supported the post-coup criminalization of the Fanmi Lavalas party. But it has been the UN, headed by the Brazilian military, that has been largely tasked with policing the social movement. Its main purpose has been to coerce the population into accepting the consequences of the coup. You've got to remember, the coup in 2004 overthrew a government that had been elected with a massive majority. It had at least 75 or so percent of the vote. It won 90 percent of the seats in Parliament. And by all you know, credible accounts, that government would remain. And you know, if it could be elected again tomorrow, it would be. You know, so uh, what the UN's main job has been is to p provide massive, overwhelming military and police presence to basically force the population into accepting it. And particularly in 2005 and 6, that's what the UN did. It, went, it, you know, it patrolled Port-au-Prince treated the population like a hostile force and in, on a couple of notorious occasions went in and, and attacked groups of uh, people who, um, who were some of Aristide and Lavalas' most, most ardent supporters and killed uh, dozens of them. In 2009, former U.S. President Bill Clinton took over as the U.N. Special Envoy on Haiti. And the people of Haiti had an economic development plan that I was helping them to implement and we're going to go back to it once the smoke clears. And the plan, known as U.S. Hope II, continues the neoliberal logic of keeping Haiti competitive in textile production. This plan was in action in the summer of 2009 when Haitian President René Preval vetoed a bill that would have raised the minimum wage to $5 per day. So here's the question. Why can't a country like Haiti catch a break? Go to CNN.com slash Cafferty file. This political and historical story is then recast as a kind of natural condition, as if Haiti is a place that is naturally poor, naturally undemocratic, and so on, when it has precisely been made to be such, um, in large part by, by foreign interference. In 2003, there was a closed-door conference in Montreal, Canada, that brought together representatives from numerous countries to discuss Haiti's future. Not a single Haitian was invited, and Canadian journalist Michel Vastel broke the story that attendees had reached consensus that Aristide had to go. And just over one year later, Aristide found himself on a U.S. plane being flown into exile in the Central African Republic. He has not been allowed back to his country since.
On Monday, the same countries will be meeting in Montreal once again for the Friends of Haiti conference. AFP reports that the meeting is, quote, expected to affirm the central role of the United States in post-quake Haiti, already illustrated by its massive military presence and relief efforts there. By the time the meeting starts on Monday, 20,000 U.S. troops are expected to be on the ground. Despite recent calls to repay the $21 billion that France extorted from post-revolution Haiti, French President Nicolas Sarkozy joined the chorus in blaming Haiti's misery on the supernatural, saying that Monday's conference should be, quote, a chance to get Haiti once and for all out of the curse it seems to have been stuck with for such a long time. Without either an acknowledgement of the roots of Haiti's poverty, nor a democratic and sovereign Haitian government to oversee reconstruction, one wonders whether the new Haiti can possibly serve the interests of Haitians.